leading theory in ufology at the present is that UFOs, extraterrestrials, are using the sea as a hiding place. They're residing in deep underwater caverns and emerging um, at will, submerging at will. When you think about this and some of the footage that the Pentagon's released showing this as proof that they are here, have been here for a long time and they are living in the ocean. It's a terrifying, terrifying concept. As I made the long journey to the Yorkshire Moors, I've been reflecting on several things, like why my windscreen was so dirty. But more seriously, I've been reflecting on what I was expecting over the next couple of days with Ben. Would I see the creepy and thought-provoking things he sometimes encounters on the Yorkshire Moors? Where? Will Ben take me? Will I be brave enough to go? Would we make a good team? All of these questions were soon to be answered as I got close to Ben's destination. After finally arriving and saying hello and catching up with Ben and a much needed cup of tea, the conversation went into further questions Ben had for me about my potential experience that I had when I was just 14. I also used this opportunity to relate it to a documentary that I am working on. If I had looked at that picture, that I would have any of the memories that I have. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, you know, the reason why I want to explore it more is because I've never taken a stance of this happened to me. Yeah. Because again, in my research, you know, and I've discussed with you things that happened within those memories that I have where I was, you know, in bed and I couldn't move and I was face down and it felt like a weight was on me, you know. Over the years of research in ufology that I've done in other areas of science, you know, I've, I've read a, a lot about sleep par um, paralysis. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of what I remember could be assigned sleep paralysis. So looking at it in a very logical, scientific way, as well as being open-minded, I've got to accept that there could be other explanations for my memories. But that's why I want to do this documentary and explore some more of the other stuff. And try and see if I can find it and the hypnotherapy session because I think that will start pushing me towards a direction where I truly believe in the experience, where I'm a kind of little bit like, even though it's my experience, I'm still sort of sat on the fence um, because you know, any number of reasons uh, could be presented that would explain those that experience or those memories, etc. Like I say, yeah. like the sleep paralysis, um, you know, influence from, you know, just media and entertainment and, and stuff like that. So, um, yeah, that, that's, that's what I'm, I'm hoping to achieve from it. So, Brilliant. let's see if that happens. So after a good catch up, Ben wants to get straight into business and take us out to an undisclosed location in the remote areas of North Yorkshire. But it's in the forest where Ben has built a bushcraft shelter and we're going to go out there in the thick of night and investigate. Where are we going then? So I've been building the shelter, it's pretty much complete now, but I've been working on this for the last few years and it's... Um right on the edge of the North Yorkshire Moors, which is like a 528 square mile area of just nothing but open moorland, woodlands, and um, it's a hotspot. There's no two ways about it. This place has a lot of strange reports coming from that area um, and has done for many, many years. So I'm gonna take you there tonight, G. Nice. Uh, I'm gonna show you the shelter. We're gonna get a fire going. And um, hopefully, fingers crossed, we might even hear or see something as well, so. Wrapping its tongue around first and pulling itself up. And I thought that was really odd, but I noticed that it's not making 
making any noise on the way up while it's doing this. It's not making any noise grabbing the tree, and it's not making any noise doing that. So I reached out like a normal human would. Brits say living legend Sir David Attenborough should represent us in the talks with aliens. He's been everywhere else, so why on earth not? How strange. Interesting. So it's so strange because me and G have just pulled into the uh, the garage to go grab a few snacks for a warm route tonight. And um, there is the newspaper stand with all the front page articles. And I was just about to say to G that the last time I was up at um, Bempton, which is also another hotspot here in the UK, there was a similar scenario. I pulled up at the garage, there it was, front, line, um, front page of the paper, something about a UFO sighting actually at Bempton. So I thought I'd just have a quick little look. And again, on the front page of the paper is another story regarding extraterrestrials. And G was just saying that they're they're, they're saying um, if we was to ever make contact with aliens, they feel like David Attenborough would be the guy to uh, to break the ice, pretty much. But I just thought, thought that that was um, quite coincidental and a bit it's, strange. It's interesting to think that there's people already starting to think about the fact that we need someone yeah. to represent us in those dis those talks yeah. with a with an alien species. So that's uh, that's a bit strange in itself that we're starting to get to the point where we need to. Uh, nominate the right person yeah. <laughs> to speak to them, but you know he would be a good uh, representative of the the human race. I think so. if they spoke English. <laughs> As we headed further out into the Yorkshire Moors and further and further into the national park, I started discussing with Ben how I was already getting an understanding of how the Yorkshire Moors is a hotbed for strange and paranormal activity. Like areas in Dartmoor back home, you can see for miles and miles in a 360 orientation and not see any human activity or presence. Activity could happen here during the day and no one or few would be around to witness. We were approaching Ben's undisclosed location and his shelter. My heart was pumping with excitement and curiosity, with maybe a slice of fear. We had to lose the car and make the rest of the journey on foot, and that's where we would hit the dark, thick forest. Making our way along the edge of the forest, I couldn't believe how tightly packed and dark and ominous the forest felt. We got to the point where we were almost parallel with Ben's camp and had to enter. I took this moment to film Ben entering the woods just to show and indicate how quickly he disappears and how dark this forest is because it sometimes doesn't come out and do justice on camera. We hadn't gone more than 10 meters into the forest when we came across something very strange and disturbing. Okay, this is a, a, a really strange thing, you know, that Ben's show me uh, and uh, apologies if it's gonna turn some of your guys' stomach, it's not a nice thing, but just Ben showed me this and said that, oh, I wonder whether it's still there. And uh, apparently, Ben, it's been here for two months, right? Yeah, two months. Well, two months when I last saw it. Two months, but so... I don't know how long before that. There's something extremely strange about that. We've only got about five metres in from the forest line into the depth of the forest. And this, you know, what looks like a baby deer, obviously you know, um, has died, but this was roughly about two months ago. And the decomposition just is not normal. Uh, if anybody knows a reason that would stop something decomposing in the normal way, because from my understanding, things that would die on a forest floor would usually take between 10 to 12 days to just completely disappear with everything 
that's in the ground and in the soil that would eat it up. So if anybody knows the reason why something, I mean, if you look at it, there's still fur on the legs and everything. It's, uh, it's head still pretty intact. Looks like the eyes have gone, but that's strange to me. So let me know what you think. This is just a crazy ass dense forest. I mean, it's cr creepy as hell. And there's just some really strange noises as well. Not like wildlife, like just like a bit banging. But uh, yeah, let's continue the journey to uh, Ben's shelter. Well, we've arrived at Ben's uh, den in the woods uh, and it's uh, mostly undisturbed, which is great. But I'm so impressed with this build. It looks amazing. Can't wait to spend some time, get the fire started and uh, wait for it to get dark, which uh, even when it's light, this place is crazy creepy. I just joked around with Ben and said, this is a witch's wet dream um, because he pointed out a tree that just didn't look like it belonged and it looked like a witch's tree. And I just said that the whole place feels like a witch's wet dream because it is freaky, it's spooky, and I can't imagine what it's gonna feel like when it's dark. And Ben comes out here by himself in the dark. And that is crazy. Oh my God, I just thought I saw something. This is, I, I'm on edge now. I'm on high alert and I just thought I saw something. Check you out in a minute. So we've just left the den. We're just doing a bit of exploring around this very, very dense wood. And you can just see how dense it is. And I'm still in awe about the fact that Ben comes out here by himself at night. And uh, we're just at the point where it's just coming to dusk, just changing from day to night. But we arrived here in the day, or the daylight, I should say, and uh, crap. It was already scary then, so yeah. And uh, I think I've, oh Jesus, I think I've lost Ben. Just come from a clearing, this first clearing, well, big clearing in the woods. But uh, then we hit this valley. We were just saying, what we do about the trees, everything pretty much still seems like it's dead but you made a good point that because it is so dense here the only place that looks like it's still alive is the tops which have reached the light yeah so you've got all the foliage and leaves at the top but the bottom parts of the trees are all kind of dead and uh you can go up to these branches and just like literally snap them off because they're not got much life left in them but then at the, if you go to the top of the tree where it can get light that's where you've got the tree is still alive. So it's alive in the roots, but uh, you know, it's not, it's not getting what it needs for these branches. And it's because the trees are just so densely packed in this area of woods. Yeah, and I guess like we were just talking about wild cats here in Britain or anything else that's roaming this land undiscovered, places like this would be an ideal um, location to stay hidden because the trees are so densely knit together. Um, you can't really see far off in the distance. So anything beyond 100 meters could move from point A to point B and you probably would never see it. Yeah. sharpener for your knife you know in the same way that you'd use a leather belt yeah so i think like um our ancestors and stuff used it for sharpening tools ben's just talking about this that we found on the tree some crazy ass fungus that looks alien it's huge i've never seen fungus like that before ever crazy Let's see how close up almost looks like it's made of uh like clay or something Crazy. Mm -hmm. 
So I'm just filming a bit of this quickly just to give you guys an idea because we've just come up here and I like, kind of got into a bit of a stuck area where we might need to find a different route but the floor is crazy dangerous and uh, yeah so I thought I'd share it with you guys as a really good example. What's the most strangest thing that you've experienced or seen in this location or is it a location where you haven't had that sort of activity just yet? I've had um, I've had a mixture of different happenings here. Um, I think mainly down um, in the realms of paranormal. Like when I brought the EMF reader out here one time, yeah, I was asking questions out openly into the woods. I had the EMF reader um, in front of me. I couldn't see what the EMF was doing because I was holding it to the camera from, from my followers and things to see. And um, right on cue, whenever I would ask a question, the EMF reader would spike. Yeah, um, and it was almost too coincidental for me when I looked back at the footage and saw how often it did that. I mean, even at one point, I, I, I said, "If there's anything near me um, that wants to make its presence presence known, please step close to the device held in my hand." Yeah. And instantly, as soon as I finished saying that, it spiked right up to red. Now we're in the middle of the woods. EMF readers only work around electronic devices. There's no underlying pipes here. There's no underlying cables. This is the North Yorkshire Moors. So. For me, that was very strange. Um, but other things as well, um, like strange noises, seems to be um, a regular occurrence I, here. I can agree with that because, as I say, I've only been here for an hour and uh, I heard one strange noise and then I think we both heard one together, didn't we? And yeah. then you heard one after that, which I failed to hear because I think I was walking at the time. Um, but yeah, and uh, it sounded like masonry, didn't it? It sounded like it stones. And just driving in here, there wasn't anywhere or anything around that was, you know, it's not a quarry uh, to my knowledge here. I didn't see one as we drove in, so um, a bit strange, but yeah. One of the, um, another thing as well to add is one of the more, more, more common reports from this area is talking. I've heard this as well myself. It's almost like human voices in conversation, but obviously you can see, G, you've been here um, a few hours now. There's no paths here, there's no public bridleways, there's no... It certainly not, isn't, no. It's not a place that you would get you, a dog walker coming through. No. You know, um, and so to hear voices, and it's always like, you know it's humans talking in conversation, but when you try and listen carefully, you can't make out what they're saying. Yeah. And um, I've heard that a few times. It's, it's a very strange, um, it's a very strange report that keeps coming forward though. And the thing is as well, to add to that, here on the Moors, I think they've uncovered like over 800 now medieval burial mounds and ancient burial mounds and they're still uncovering more all the time so it, it definitely does have a paranormal element a strong paranormal element night time had caught up on us it was becoming increasingly difficult to film so we had to head back to camp and get the campfire started and once there we sat down and again had a really good chat but ben got out the emf reader so it's interesting that even across the whole category of cryptids, they work in very different ways. But, you know, that's what I find so magnetic about the sort of wild men kind of thing is that really, you know, if there's nothing to it, why are there so many people still talking about it? Because it doesn't, it doesn't bring anything to anyone, you know? So, 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 you know, and... We're about to see Discovery Free of just day one called strange emf readings the emf machine is right in front of ben's head if you keep an eye on it you'll notice the lights start flashing as i'm talking ben doesn't notice it at first emf stands for electromagnetic field and that's what the machine picks up our phones are well away from the machine because that's what we're filming on currently so we don't have any other electric equipment near the machine Keep watching. With, with everything, whether we're talking UF, ufology, whether we're talking ghosts and hauntings and, and or, or um, cryptids, I'm a firm believer that, you know, there's at least somewhere around the just region. Say, just say ghosts and paranormal again. Ghosts and paranormal. Did it go up again? Yeah. We did it twice, I think, when you mentioned the paranormal. Um, you know... It's, um, it, it's, it's kind of like, I think there's about two to five percent 
in all categories that are probably, you know, there's some real truth to, to what's happening. So the conversation flowed for quite some time and possibly in part three to this series, you'll be able to see the full unedited conversation by the campfire between myself and Ben. But shortly, what Ben does, and this shows Ben's experience, is because we've had an activity on the EMF machine, he starts talking out or calling out to any potential spirits or ghostly beings that may be occupying the same space and the woodlands and the forest that we are occupying at the moment. Obviously, you can imagine I was extremely happy with this. If there's anything in this forest with us right now, that wishes to make its presence known, please step near the device to my right hand side. It did flash as I said that. If that was you that made the device flash, please step closer again. I can't tell if it's my eye frame. Can you see that? No, I can't see it. I'm gonna just stand out here for a minute. If there is anybody in the vicinity with us here in this forest that wishes to make their presence known, please step to close to the device. If you could just... No, I can't see it. I'm going to just stand out here for a minute. If there is anybody in the vicinity with us here in this forest that wishes to make their presence known, please step to close to the device. If you could make the device go up to the yellow symbol in the middle it definitely flashed after calling out some more we didn't get any definitive or timely responses uh, with the reactions on the EMF reader but that's not to say there wasn't any more strange and curious and thought provoking activity that happened throughout the rest of the conversation and chat that myself and Ben were having around the campfire but you guys will have to watch out for part three to be able to see the whole conversation and all the strange activity that went on for now it was getting late and it had been a long day for me with almost seven and a half hours of driving and all this hiking around this amazing but scary and very very strange and spooky woods with Ben and it was time to hit the sack. Before I did, I was reflecting on all the things that I had already seen and discovered in my short time with Ben in North Yorkshire. Discovery number one, a slowly decomposing deer. That was very strange. And as I put in the text, I forgot to say as I was there in the moment that I didn't notice any maggots on it and it's been there for two months there would have been wet rain it just didn't seem to be de decomposing um, for something that's been there for two months very crazy very strange then we came across discovery number two and some really interesting fungus not paranormal certainly not but very interesting and strange I'd never seen fungus like that before and then Discovery number three, the EMF reader going off and going a bit crazy. Then, discovery number four, and that strange noise which I've listened to time and time again, and I can't explain or make a very quick answer where that noise is coming from. And to me, it definitely sounds like something metal scraping on stone. Can't explain that one. It had been an amazing day one with Ben from the 401 Files in North Yorkshire. You guys are going to have to join me for part two of this series to see all the discoveries that we make on day two and they get much more scary, much more freaky and you do not want to miss out. Join me for then. You guys have been watching the Underground Paradox. Keep yourself safe. Always look behind you always keep your eyes in front.